Hello and welcome. I am Lillian Agbeyegbe, your friendly community health educator. I am excited to welcome you to another episode of Your Public Health Professional and You, coming to you courtesy of the Maryland Public Health Association. If you joined us last month, you already know, but if you haven't joined us before, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Maryland Public Health Association. The Maryland Public Health Association is the state chapter of the American Public Health Association, and it has existed since 1955. Or has it? I'll throw in a fun fact. Coming to you courtesy of Judy Gann, our current president of the Maryland Public Health Association. Jody let me know after our last episode that the Maryland Public Health Association actually began in 1897. Yes, it went into a period of stagnation. It was in 1955 that the Articles of Incorporation was drawn. So when you hear 1955, that's not exactly when we started. We've been here way back 1897. One of the first chapters, because the American Public Health Association itself was inaugurated in 1872. Maryland Public Health Association, our vision here is healthy Marylanders living in healthy communities. And that's why we're coming to you with your public health professional and you our way of making sure that you, the public, understand how we are serving you and what you can do to make our partnership a very profitable one. This conversation series we're having every month will bring a public health practitioner working here in the state of Maryland so that you can get to know what they do, get to know them and understand why your public health practitioner is interested in your well-being. Today promises to be a very exciting episode because I am talking to no other person today than Maria Julian. Maria Julian is the executive director of Counter2. That's a nonprofit organization that works on advanced place-based public health. From startups to local governments in the United States and abroad, Maria has led teams through the implementation of behavior change strategies to improve health outcomes. Prior to joining Counter Tools, Maria led a 20-man team in the implementation and evaluation of public health policy systems and environmental programs at the Rural District Health Department. Maria earned her Master of Public Administration from Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey, she served as a Peace Corps volunteer in Moldova from 2011 to 2012. That's a lot going on there. Maria, I'm excited to have this conversation with you today. Thanks so much for having this conversation. I'm excited to be here. Great. So there's a lot going on there. There's counter to, there's evaluation, there's behavioral change. There's a lot going there. Maria, what do you do as a public health practitioner? So right now I help lead and coordinate our team at Counter Tools and our mission is to empower communities to become healthier places for all. And we got our start 10 years ago helping public health departments, state and local health departments assess the retail environment as it relates to tobacco products. We've since today grown in our breadth and depth of that mission and we still support state and local health departments, but also behavioral health departments, other government entities, sometimes enforcement entities as well, to assess the retail environment for alcohol, tobacco, and a little bit of cannabis as that starts to gain traction, and healthy food. So looking at the retail environment, which is oftentimes the most critical point of contact where these substances enter our community, and thinking about both macro and micro level factors of the retail environment how this impacts youth initiation of these products, how it impacts, um, for example, a smoker who has quit and wants to stay quit or is on that quit journey still, um, how the marketing and advertising and targeting of the tobacco industry impacts and marginalize, uh, marginalized communities disproportionately so. 
And we actually work also with the state of Maryland, in addition to about half of US states that we've worked with at some point. That is very interesting. So it's keeping people safe, looking at tobacco and the environment. Um, if I stepped out my door now and I'm talking to my neighbor and I say to my neighbor, um, I'm talking to Maria, and this is a public health practitioner working with the state of Maryland to help you. How do I explain what you're doing and how it impacts my neighbor or my young daughter who's a youth person to say, this public health practitioner is helping you working with the government. What can I say to them to get you, your work across to them? Definitely. Well, we're absolutely the behind the scenes people. There's all different roles in public health, as we know, and ours is really to support the superstars at, for example, in Maryland, the this public health department who are doing incredible work. They're the masterminds behind their strategy, um, but we're supporting them to provide them with evidence and storytelling materials to make a really strong case for policy change. So they're going out and coordinating data collectors who are assessing the retail environment in the convenience stores and other stores across the entire state of Maryland who sell tobacco. And they're trying to figure out, are tobacco products located near colorful products and products close to candy, for example? Are they three feet above the ground because they're really trying to be targeted toward children or young people, youth, who really you know shouldn't have such exposure to these products? And also thinking about What's the proximity of our tobacco retailers to schools and parks and playgrounds and things? So we provide training and technical assistance and the software that enables the wonderful public health practitioners we have in Maryland to do their job even more effectively and to tell the story of their community's health by having compelling maps that show density and proximity of retailers such as tobacco and help advocate for the right kinds of policy change in Maryland that are gonna really make a difference. This is interesting. So if I'm hearing you right, when my young person goes out and they don't find tobacco products near their school, it somehow has something to do with the work that you're doing. And yes, and absolutely, we can't take any, you know, direct credit for it. Yeah, that's why I said somehow has, is somehow, somehow has to do with the work that you're doing. The information that you're so providing to the people who are um, advocating for those policies. So there's a policy in place now that says that um, tobacco companies can sell tobacco near schools. It has something to do with the work that public health practitioners like you doing behind the scene, providing the evidence to say these stores can be closed to schools because this can influence young people to start smoking. And we know that if they start smoking earlier, it's much more difficult for them to stop smoking. So the work that you that you're supporting, you're supporting people who make this possible. Certainly. Yes. Yeah. And it's a really collaborative effort. And it's nice to be able to learn and understand examples and successes across states and across communities. What has worked in one community may not work exactly in another, but we can learn from each other what, awesome. what has worked. Awesome. So we're learning from each other. We're going out. And I like the other one you spoke about. So when somebody goes to the store and just thinks that um, the pro tobacco products mm -hmm. are not next to the candy that didn't just happen organically. It was a deliberate effort by public health practitioners working with people like you working behind the scene, providing them the evidence to say, okay, there's a way in which if we place these products close to candy, somebody might just take them, you know, and they just they're going for the candy and they're like, why not the cigarettes as well? You know. It's it's so yeah. true. It's it's deliberate on on the part of the tobacco industry, the placement of products, the promotion of them, the pricing, and it's deliberate certainly on the public health side to try to counteract all of those influences um, that are so prevalent in our community. So the tobacco industry is being deliberate and saying, okay, the people are going to smoke, then public health practitioners are working and saying, 
we see the evidence. We know how tobacco smoke impacts health outcomes. So we want to change this behavior and we're going to help people, state governments and, or advocates who go and advocate for policies. Um, I was super excited last year. I think it was the beginning of last year when the legal age to uh, buy cigarette was raised from 18 to 21. I was like, yay. I had nothing to do with the advocacy, but I was like, yay, I know this is good for public health. Certainly. And there's such an important role that state and local public health play, even in a policy like that at the federal level that moved the tobacco, the legal age to 21, because there wasn't much funding or implementation support around that policy. So mm -hmm. even though it passed, it's still more important than ever for each state and local community to ensure they pass their own T21 law and that it has stringent processes and a, a means of tracking, enforcing the policy and making sure that we're supporting the local players who are making that policy effective. So they have their work cut up for them and <laughs> they do a fabulous job here in Maryland. We're really fortunate to have a strong public health system. Maryland, thank you, public health practitioners in Maryland. I, I see the excitement. I see your face light up um, when you're talking about this work, but it's a master public administration and then it's public health. Sam, like, how did you get into public health? From What was your bachelor's in? Did you always know you wanted to be a public health practitioner? How did that happen? I think like a lot of people, I stumbled into public health and said, wait a second, this is a career? This is a whole field? This is what I've been looking for. And uh, my journey started, I suppose, about 15, 16 years ago. Um, I interned for an um, alcohol, drug, and mental health board of the county seat in Ohio, where I was growing up at the time. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I wanted to talk and write about health. And I knew that I had a special passionate interest for behavioral health, but I had no idea where that, where that would lead. And then took other roles that were more focused on international development, but was still looking for that connection to health. I just didn't understand population level health yet until I had a few roles that were not so upstream and were looking at um, small but impactful intervention and change with a small group of people. And I thought there's gotta be a more effective way to enact change. Why are we not thinking of zooming out and thinking of the bigger picture here? Mm -hmm. And that's when I discovered public health. I think shortly uh, in the beginning of my MPA uh, degree, and I really saw a lot of overlap between public administration and public health. You yeah. need still a background in the discipline of governance, finance, essentially running a business, even if mm -hmm. it is a nonprofit or government mm -hmm. entity, is still really important to be effective, even if the subject matter is public health. Mm -hmm. So I continued on with my public administration degree, but knew that public health was that specialty that I really mm -hmm. wanted to focus on. And then finally had a more traditional public health role that started maybe about 10 years ago um, mm -hmm. at a rural district health department in the Appalachian region of North Carolina. Mm -hmm. and really dipped my toes in there to how stretched resources can be, um, but also how collaborative and community-based public health work really can be. And I've never turned back since then. Finally found my passion and the field um, made up of great professionals like yourselves, the, where I wanted to really focus the rest of my time. Awesome. This is, this is exciting to hear the path that brought you here. And when you talk about professionals, collaboration, um, you're a member of the Maryland Public Health Association. What does that mean to you? Yes, I'm still discovering the benefits, truly, because I moved with my family to Baltimore, see, a little over two years ago. Thank and one you. of the first thing I things I did was join MDPHA. I had been active in APHA in the alcohol, tobacco, and other drug section of the American Public Health Association. But I had found a lot of benefits in the prior state where I lived and worked with that state affiliate. And I knew right away I needed to connect with MDPHA here. Immediately connected with some really rock star um, folks involved, like Ramey Eck, who um, encouraged me to get involved in the advocacy committee and started to get to know the people who make MBPHA special. And now that we're starting to maybe move toward in-person gatherings a little bit more, I was able to meet some people in person this summer um, and 
continue to be involved in the advocacy committee. Um, but it's clear that MDPHA is very active, one of the most established state affiliates we have. And I'm amazed by the subcommittees and how active they truly are. Awesome. And tell us a little bit about the advocacy committee that you belong to. What do you do there? I'm very much an observer and in awe of, of the f folks really working and tracking the many policies happening. But during the legislative session, the committee is extremely busy having very frequent updates to make sure folks know what policy be is being considered, how we can advocate, how we can stay involved and be vocal, how we can equip other advocates with the information that they need to communicate and educate our decision makers. Awesome. It's been so exciting to um, listen to you and get to hear about how you got into public health, the work that you're doing, working behind the scenes, but um, really providing, helping, making sure that data is available for people working in the forefront to go out and advocate, working in collaboration, partnership, and that's all public health is about. Um, I wanted to close this out in three questions. It's sort of like, What's your message for members of the public in Maryland about public health practitioners? And one of the things that we did find out, which is how this um, conversation series got initiated, um, we found out during the time of COVID is people really don't know public health practitioners, don't know what they do, and like, who are those people? What are they talking about? So what's your message for um, the public about public health practitioners and the work that they do in the Maryland? That's a great question. I think the message would be that there's a public health place in just about any day-to-day -day function that we have if we are making the connection to health. And one of the most magical things about public health that I appreciate is the way that we think about those upstream levers that we have that are going to pay dividends later on. So I guess I would encourage folks to think that we can either pay now or pay later mm -hmm. for the, the conditions we have in our community and our environment and encourage folks to reach out to the public health folks that they do know. And if they don't, to, to reach out to their local public health department and see how they might be able to get involved um, because community is such a cornerstone of our work. Without the community-led collaboration, Nothing in our work can be, I think, meaningful or significant. So it takes all of us. It's a very collaborative field, like you said. Yeah. Um, so there's a place for all of us, I think, to be involved in public health. Awesome. It takes all of us. There's a place for all of us. And getting to all of us, um, the field and the practitioner, you didn't come in any traditional route. So if somebody was thinking public health, yes, no, how do I do it? Why should I do it? what what's sort of like your advice for them somebody knows that they want to do public health or somebody doesn't know but they're thinking about it how does somebody get into the field oh so many great ways i mean a really old-fashioned way that i think can be very beneficial to to learn and understand is to reach out and ask if you can truly just tag along with someone for the day mm -hmm. and wander around maybe you know local public health organization our entity. And I think folks would be amazed at the diversity of the activities happening. You can tag along for an environmental health inspection um, at a local restaurant or child care center. You can understand um, and be really active in policy change that's happening. You can attend community hearings and help organize, you know, com community mobilization about just around any topic that's passionate to you. So I think it would be just to See if you can reach out to the folks already doing public health. I'm sure they'd be more than happy to welcome you and, and share about their challenges, their wins, and what they love about public health too. And in terms of education as well, do you think this is a restricted field? Do you really have to have one particular kind of background to go into the field or just your passion and interest is enough to get you started? Oh, it's one of the things I really love about public health is how interdisciplinary it is. You know, I have a public administration background. There are folks on our team from social work to straight up technology or business or marketing, sales. Um, it really, I think, takes a well-rounded team 
who maybe doesn't have the the traditional discipline background in public health, like an MPH or beyond. Um, but we can all tap into understanding population level health, I think, in our own way. So I think it's very accessible to all of us. Very accessible to all of us. So if you are out there and you've been wondering what you can do to improve public health outcomes, you might just ask somebody around you, go to your pub, local public health department. Um, Google is your friend, although be careful, a lot of false information on the internet, we know that. But find something that can stay you in the right direction. And if you want to go do a degree in public health, that's also a good place to start. Uh, before we go, I'd like to say, um, you said you moved to Maryland two years ago, about two years ago, and you are a member of the Maryland Public Health Association. Now I know that there's some public health practitioners who have been in this state for more than two years, who have still not joined the Maryland Public Health Association. Um, what's your charge to public health practitioners in the state who have not yet joined the association? Well, we know in public health, we we need to work together and pull together. We're up against some really strong forces um, in, in all facets of public health. And we know it takes all of us. And it's an incredible network for exchanging information, ideas and learning that MDPHA provides. It's a no brainer, you know, to connect with like minded folks who can help support your work, who can help enrich um, and educate all of us on the work that we're doing. So highly encourage you to reach out. It's it's an instant network um, of folks to really benefit from. We are waiting for you. You can find us online, www.mdpha.org and find them where you can join. We have um, committees that you can join. Whatever your passion is, you can join communications committee, subcommittee. You can join the advocacy subcommittee. We have people working on environmental issues. We promote job opportunities. Um, we try and work with um, mentoring. We have a student section. So if you're in school, there's somewhere for you to fit in. Um, before we go, Maria, do you have any last words, last insights, last anything that you'd like to share with us? I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to get to speak with you today and to reflect on my time so far with MDPHA. It really is a great network and an opportunity to be a part of it. So I couldn't agree more. I encourage everyone who hasn't already connected with MDPHA to check it out. Great. So you heard that from Maria. Of course, she's an MDPHA member. So yes, she's right in asking you to check it out. I'm also an MDPHA member, so I am also going to ask you to check it out. Um, this is my name is Lilian Agbayegbe. I am your friendly community health educator coming to you with your public health professional and you, courtesy of the Maryland Public Health Association, where our vision is really Marylanders living in healthier communities. We want to make sure that you know we are out here working for you. We are interested in making sure that you stay healthy if anything happens you're able to recover and be healthy you can send us any information questions comment our email is getinfo at mdpha.org until i come your way again stay healthy and do all the right things get in your physicals and all of the wonderful thing this is october um so many things to be aware about breast cancer domestic violence and people are out there sharing information Pay attention, there's something you can do to stay healthy and we hope you'll do it. I'll talk to you again when I come your way next time. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.